Chapter One: Thornton's Ward. Maria was awakened by a furious beating at the cottage door. Who could it be? She wondered. At this late hour, silently she rose from the pile of ancient quilts that served as her bed and crept from the dark loft to the door at the bottom of the stairs, opening the door only a slice, for she knew better than to be caught milling about. She peered into the adjoining room. Her aunt and uncle, having left their chamber, grumbled and argued as they rather stumbled along together toward the cottage door. Who would dare disturb us at this hour? Aunt Eula Holt complained, tightening her night robe about her and adjusting her nightcap. Her short, round husband followed her, cursing under his breath. Maybe that brat's out and about stirring up mischief. Edgar Holt growled. Might as well drown children at thirteen years as put up with their nonsense. Well said, Eula grumbled, nodding her agreement. The beating on the door suddenly increased in volume, causing Maria to startle slightly. She quickly forgot her uncle and aunt's spiteful remarks about her age and uselessness as her eyes widened in anticipation. What goings on could cause someone to beat on the door in the dead of the night? Robbers, perhaps? Maria shook her head. Knowing full well robbers would no sooner knock on a door than verbally shout out their intentions. Just a moment, just a moment. We're coming, her aunt screeched. Maria saw her aunt open the cottage door and heard her ask, "Who dares disturb us at such an hour? I hope you have good reason for." The homely woman hushed, however, and Maria gasped as an enormous man suddenly burst into the cottage. The dark trespasser was followed by a small, thin man who wore spectacles. He nodded at her aunt and uncle in turn. "Where is she, woman?" the tall, dark intruder growled. Maria's aunt quickly regained her composure and shouted, "Who do you think you are, forcing yourself into our home as such?" "Where is the girl?" the dark man demanded. "You had better cooperate with me, woman." Otherwise, this will go very badly. The smaller man adjusted his spectacles and interrupted, "Is this indeed the residence of Edgar and Eula Holt?" "Well, well, yes, but I still do not see why you think you can simply." Eula began, "Do you have residing here in your care one Miss Maria Castillo Holt?" The spectacled man inquired. Maria tucked a strand of ebony hair behind one ear. Her eyes widening, her heart pounding at the mention of her name, she held her breath, entranced as she watched the color drain from her aunt's face. Her uncle cleared his throat and, with a raspy voice, answered, "My niece, my brother's child. Yes, she lives here with us. Give her over to me at once!" The towering man shouted, taking a clearly threatening step in her uncle's direction. He stopped when the spectacled man put a hand to his arm. "Master Brockton, please," the spectacled man said to him calmly. Turning, the man in the spectacles handed Edgar Holt a small calling card and said, "My card. I am Jacob Peterson, solicitor for Lord Richard Thornton and his son Brockton. I have here the last will and testament of one Charles Victor Holt. The will states, without question." That in the event of his demise, being his beloved wife Lucia Maria Castile Holt, had previously departed this life, his only child, one Maria Castile Holt, is to be placed in the home of Lord Richard Benton Thornton. He also being appointed sole guardian until such time as, in short, we've come to transport the child to her rightful guardian and residence. Let me repeat myself. Give the child over to me at once," the larger man growled at Maria's aunt. "Master Brockton, please," Jacob Peterson said quietly to his enraged companion. The large man sighed heavily and turned from the others. The dim light from the lamp Maria's aunt carried illuminated his face then, and Maria gasped at the sight of him. She was very young; it was true. But even eyes as young and innocent as hers could recognize pure perfection of face and form in a man such as stood there in the cottage. Maria moved to cover her gaping mouth with one hand, 
causing the door to creak open a bit more. The almost inaudible sound arrested the man's attention, however. He stared then, frowning in the direction from whence it came. No, no, Maria whispered to herself, panicked as he began striding in her direction. Master Brockton, Brockton, sir, Jacob Peterson called as he watched the son of his employer stride toward the door. Brockton pulled the door open, and Maria stood unmoving, staring up, up, up into the handsome but angry face looking down at her. A perplexed expression momentarily crossed the striking countenance of Brockton Thornton. Reaching out, he cupped the girl's chin in one strong and gloved hand. Peterson, she is here, he said, his tone somewhat softer than before. Now wait a minute, Eula Holt began, walking toward them. She is our charge. I'll not let you. No, ma'am, she is not. She is the word of my father, and she will be taken to my home this night, Brockton growled, still gazing down at Maria. Maria was entranced, her breath gone from her, her heart pounding like some furious drum. The pure essence of the man before her seemed to wash over her like a warm summer rain, and she could only stare up at him in awed silence. Edgar! Eula shouted, turning to her husband. Edgar Holt cleared his throat once more. <clears throat> Sir, I am her uncle, blood relation. We will be keeping the girl. Brockton Thornton ignored the man as he spoke to Maria. Gather your things, girl. You'll not have to reside with these degenerates any longer. His voice was rich and low, and sent a quiver of unfamiliar security erupting through Maria. She smiled warmly up at him, resisting the urge to throw her arms about his neck and embrace him thankfully. His eyes narrowed, and his frown softened as Maria spoke. Do you mean to say you're truly going to take me away from, from here? I do. This very night, child, he assured her. Again, the sound of his voice caused Maria's breath to still for a moment. Now, run and gather your belongings, he said. Maria's eyes were alight with delight, and fearing she might still be unable to resist embracing him, she rushed past him, saying, I've no belongings to gather, sir. Taking Jacob Peterson's hand in her own, she shook it vigorously and said, Thank you as well, Mr. Peterson. Maria smiled when the serious-faced, spectacled man smiled at her. She mused smiles from a solicitor were rare, and she felt warmed by his smiling at her. Now see here, Eula began. Constable Henry is just outside, madam. If you would prefer to invite him in to add validity to our claim, I'm certain he will be more than happy to oblige, Jacob Peterson said firmly. She's just annoyed because she'll have to tend to the cottage herself and do her own washing now, Mr. Peterson, Maria whispered to him. She does not really care if I leave. Thus, may we go now? Yes, girl, we'll go now, Brockton replied, coming to stand next to her. His eyes traveled the length of her then, a frown puckering his handsome brow. Yet surely you have a cape, a wrap, something to warm you. The snow is heavy out. No, just this, Maria said, motioning to the threadbare gray dress she wore. It was obviously too small. Brockton looked the child up and down once more, his eyes resting on her feet, which were wrapped in articles resembling what had once been shoes. Suddenly, the young man lunged toward Maria's uncle as his anger exploded again. You miserable, he began raising a fist. His intent was obvious, to let it go against the weak jaw of the fat, spineless man. Edgar Holt doubled over to protect himself as Maria stepped between them. Looking up into the angry face of her defender, she smiled and said, It's all right and good now. You and Mr. Peterson have come, haven't you? Jacob Peterson cocked one eyebrow looking on in astonished wonder as the powerful young man stared into the deep blue of the young girl's eyes. Yes, yes, we've come, Brockton said, smiling and lowering his fist. He turned to Peterson and chuckled. <laughs> She's an enchantress, I believe, Jacob. Peterson smiled and nodded, 
She would have to be to calm your anger thus, Master Brockton. I'll not let you take her, Eula argued. Think of it. Two men taking charge of a young girl. It's not proper, and I'll not have the country saying I allowed, Aunt Eula began, feigning concern. Maria smiled again at her handsome rescuer. This man is a gentleman, Aunt Eula. Of course, you would not be expected to recognize that. <gasps> Impertinent wench, Eula gasped. Take the little wretch, then, though I'd not wish her sharp tongue on even the likes of you. Brockton removed his heavy black cloak and wrapped it tightly around Maria. Effortlessly scooping her up in his arms, he strode toward the door. Good evening, he growled, smiling acidly at the remaining occupants of the cottage. Come along, Peterson. We have what we came for. Maria glanced over Brockton's shoulder, watching her aunt and uncle as she was carried from their home. Oddly, she felt herself offering a wave of farewell, a strange yet small pricking of sentiment in her heart. They were, after all, her blood relations. Yet, as they simply lifted their noses in the air and closed the cottage door, Maria was reminded of how she would never miss them. Brockton mumbled to Jacob, Vile couple, I'll tell you that. Maria looked into the perfect face of the man who carried her. What must he think of her eagerness to go so easily with him? Thank you, sir, she began. I'm certain you think me very ignorant to come away with you so willingly but I'm assured nothing can be worse than living with them as I did. Astonishingly, innocence is still evident, Jacob Peterson said, shaking his head in disgust. The scowl returned to Brockton's face as he said, And I am thankful for it. Maria chose to be silent, only partly understanding their inferences. Opening the door to the coach, Brockton gently placed Maria inside. Moving aside, he allowed Peterson to seat himself first, following him into the conveyance. Maria was disappointed when Jacob sat next to her rather than the dashing Brockton. Yet she was safe and warm, pursued, freed, and protected. Home then, Tom, Brockton shouted to the coachman. The carriage lurched forward, and Maria pulled Brockton's cloak more tightly around her. Even for the dark of midnight, the brilliance of the full moon allowed sufficient light into the coach, and Maria could not help but smile as she glanced quickly at her handsome rescuer. They've treated you badly, obviously, Brockton suddenly growled. Maria shrugged and turned her face to gaze out the window into the moonlight. To what extent were you mistreated, girl? he asked. Maria continued to stare out the window as she answered. And answer she did, for such a voice and such a man could not be dismissed. Merely neglected, sir, perhaps overworked, resented as well, I suppose, yet nothing I'll not recover from quickly, I assure you. Brockton released an angry breath and continued, Were you aware your father had named my father as guardian to you? Maria ventured to look at him then, battling the tears threatening to escape her eyes. If your father is Lord Richard Thornton, yes. My father spoke of him often. I, I thought... You thought you were not wanted in my family, Brockton finished for her. Maria nodded and returned her gaze to the night once again. Your aunt and uncle spirited you away before his lordship was able to locate you, Miss Holt, Jacob Peterson explained. Maria only nodded, afraid her voice would reveal the true depth of her emotion if she spoke. She wiped a tear from her cheek. Are you indeed thirteen at this point, girl? Brockton asked. She nodded again, pulling the massive cloak more snugly about her. Well then, Brockton continued, this is Jacob Peterson, and I'm Brockton Thornton. My father, Lord Thornton, is extremely ill and was unable to attend to you himself. Please believe me when I tell you only illness as excessive as his could render him incapable of finding you. I hope I will suffice in his place. I assure you, you are more than wanted in our home. My mother will no doubt be beside herself with joy at the onset of your arrival. Lady Thornton is a wonderful, kind, and loving woman, Miss Holt. You'll feel quite at home with her, 
Jacob Peterson added reassuringly. There was silence then. No one spoke until Jacob at last suggested. Let's rest, all of us, he suggested. The hour is late, and it is such a long way. You must indeed be tired, Miss Holt, Brockton said. To be awakened as such in the dead of dark night, it would be wise to at least rest your eyes. Yes, Maria said, feeling disappointed somehow. Yes, I suppose I am tired. Though how sleep would ever come, she did not know. She had only just been liberated, and now she sat in a carriage with the most handsome man the heavens had seen fit to place on the earth, and she was expected to sleep? She was on her way to a new home, to meet with strangers. However did they expect her to slumber? Yet inside the coach all was quiet as it moved rhythmically along. Before the quarter of the hour had passed, Maria was, indeed, deep in contented slumber. She's a beautiful girl. Jacob whispered, assured the girl slept. Yes, Brockton agreed, studying the sleeping miss. I had heard stories of her mother's beauty. Still, I did not expect she's only thirteen after all. The blackest hair and bluest eyes, Jacob whispered. The heritage of Spain is certainly apparent. Brockton smiled as he watched his friend adjust his spectacles and examine the napping girl again. Brockton studied her a moment as well. He could only ineptly attempt to fathom what the child's beauty would be once she was a grown woman. Judging from the beauty that she already possessed, it would be unsurpassed. Her lips were red and her mouth rather the shape of a heart. Thick, ebony, and exceptionally long lashes fluttered every now and again as she slept, hiding the brilliance of her eyes. Her hair was lush and long, and held a bluish tinge, so black was it. The form of her figure was unsettlingly developed as well, and further manifested evidence of the faultless, feminine contours that would be hers in matured womanhood. It is no doubt the woman resented her, Master Brockton, Jacob whispered as he continued his survey of the girl. Brockton quietly chuckled. I believe she has bewitched you, Peterson. I've never seen you stare at any person thus previously. Peterson smiled, removed his spectacles, and began polishing the lenses with a handkerchief. Yes, and noticeably, she's a sharp little chit in the parcel. And so it would seem, Brockton agreed, smiling as he closed his own eyes, resting his head against the back of the conveyance. A rut in the road and the accompanying jolt of the coach awakened Maria. She looked about, momentarily forgetting where she was. Yet, in a moment, her memories flooded her consciousness, and her eyes were drawn to the remarkable form of Brockton Thornton. As Jacob Peterson snored quietly at her side, Maria could only stare at Brockton, awed as she considered him. She found his great height somewhat intimidating, but masculine all the same. She wondered at his age, twenty and five years, perhaps. Surely at least twenty and two or three for there was no mere boy possessed of such large stature and squared jaw. A straight and perfect nose, to match the chiseled lines of his face as well. Oh, he was a handsome man. Though his eyes were now closed, Maria remembered their deep, mapled brown, his dark brows and eyelashes, and perfect painter's portrait mouth were visible, and she smiled at the sight of them before her. Her smile broadened, as she thought of this epitome of masculinity exposing one charming dimple at his left cheek when he had first smiled at her. The dimple lent a touch of boyhood to his otherwise wholly mature appearance, and she liked it best of all his features. As she studied him further, she noted his hair was exceedingly unusual in its tint. For the most part, it was brown, but now and again a fleck of gold appeared midst the abounding chestnut. Maria thought it charming in its distinctiveness. Suddenly pulling her gaze from him, she felt herself blush. She wondered if her mere thirteen years and dependent circumstances named her attraction to Brockton Thornton exceedingly inappropriate. In an effort to distract herself, she turned her attentions to the man next to her. Instantly she smiled. What contrast! 
Jacob Peterson was not a handsome man in the least of it. Maria thought him somewhat cute, however, like a puppy newly birthed. Yet for all his stiffness and severity, he was pleasant. He owned thin, very fair hair, barely a line for each lip, and a rather unfairly pronounced nose. Maria continued to smile all the same. She knew she was much better off in the care of the two men with whom she shared the carriage than living with her uncle and aunt. Surely life would be happier, full, and carefree in the home of Lord Thornton. Closing her eyes once more, Maria tried to imagine a new life, a life filled with warm hearths and those who had been friends to her parents, a life filled with a thing so wonderful as Brockton Thornton to gaze upon every day. The halting of the carriage woke Maria once again, and she blushed as she found Brockton studied her unwaveringly. He did not look away until the coachman opened the door. At last, I'm as stiff as a corpse, he grumbled, stepping out of the carriage. Thornton Manor, Miss Holt, after two years, you are home at last. Jacob exhaled, adjusting his spectacles and smiling warmly at her. He stood down from the coach, and Maria began to follow. Only wait, the mud is deep here, Brockton said as he glanced around at the ground. Maria gasped as he took her hand, pulling her from the carriage and into the cradle of his arms. As he turned, Maria's mouth gaped in astonishment as she saw, for the first time, the beautiful grandeur of Thornton Manor. It was a vast and wonderful work of stone, with four high-reaching turrets and a lovely dressing of ivy vine. The windows glowed warm an enchanting invitation through early morning shadows. As Brockton carried her toward the manor house, a beautiful and elegant woman came fairly floating down the steps to meet them. She was a tall woman, with hair the unique tints of Brockton's. Oh, Brock, darling, you found her. You've brought her to me, the lovely woman called. The woman was undeniably Brockton's mother for Maria noted she bore a dimple on one of her own cheeks. Yes, mother, indeed, I've brought you a girl to pramp and pamper and dote over. Now let us in. We are chill-bitten and voracious, he chuckled. Of course, oh, of course, Lady Thornton cooed. Darling, you must be frozen through and through, she said to Maria. N no, my lady, I, I am quite well, Maria stammered feeling all the more abhorrent of her appearance than ever she had before. Well, darling, we'll warm you straight away, Lady Thornton said softly. Her smile was like sunshine, and Maria felt glad to be near her. Once inside the manor house, Brockton let Maria's feet fall to the floor, and she quickly curtsied to his mother. Lady Thornton's eyes widened with delight. Oh, Brock, darling, she's simply enchanting the very image of her mother. So I gathered, Brock muttered. The very image. Hello, Maria, Lady Thornton said quietly, extending her hand toward the girl. I'm Emmeline Thornton, Brock's mother. Maria tentatively offered her own hand, expecting the woman to grasp it in welcome and release it. Instead, Lady Thornton clutched Maria's hand tightly and enticed the girl nearer with her maternally entrancing smile. Drawing in her breath, Lady Thornton donned an expression of utter joy. Looking past Maria to her son, she said, Lovely, Brock, isn't she? Yes, mother, she's adorable, he chuckled. No doubt we'll need an entire room for the wardrobe mother has in mind for you, girl. Maria smiled feeling as if warm syrup were being drizzled into her mouth as she gazed up into Brockton's face as he smiled at her. The dimple in his cheek was entirely charming. Maria looked away from Brockton, her eyes widening in surprise as Lady Thornton suddenly squealed with delight. Oh, I'm so happy to have you here with us at last. Lord Thornton, my husband, will want to see you the moment you've eaten and rested. It is all too exciting. The ecstatic woman smiled at her son, fairly beaming resplendent joy. Now, Maria, let's go up and draw a warm bath for you. Then, I cannot wait to get my hands in that hair of yours, Lady Thornton giggled. 
Taking hold of Maria's hand, she led Maria toward a high, winding staircase. Maria paused, however, and, turning to the two men who stood watching, said, Thank you. Thank you both for your trouble. How can I ever... Do not trouble yourself with thanks, for no doubt the day will come when you may regret... Brockton began, his smile fading, the charming dimple in his cheek disappearing all at once. Thank you, Miss Holt, for trusting us, Jacob Peterson finished. Maria almost frowned, puzzled by Brockton's response to her thanks. Still, donning a grateful smile, she allowed Lady Thornton, chattering excitedly all the while, to lead her along up the stairs. Perhaps we should not have sought her out, delivered her. Perhaps, Peterson, we should have left her there. When the day comes, when she's told, Brockton muttered, watching his mother lead the girl up the staircase. Not to worry, Master Brockton. When the day comes, I believe she will bless it, Jacob said. He patted the young man on the shoulder and turned to seek out the father. Lord Thornton must be informed of a task fulfilled.